right, Judges uh, chapter 6 is where we left off. I'm going to summarize a little bit of chapter 6 before we get into chapter 7 because it's been so long since the, uh, the holiday break uh, on our uh, study through the book of Judges. And so let me just, for the purpose of bringing us up to speed, if you're new to our Bible study, particularly in regards to the book of Judges, let me just um, let you know this cycle of sin that existed in Israel at this particular time. This is why the book of Judges was written. Uh, you have, if you start at the top of the cycle with me, Israel serves the Lord. They, they honor Him. They obey Him. They love Him. But then, unfortunately, they fall into sin and idolatry. They become influenced by the foreign uh, pagan nations around them. They start to adopt uh, some of these foreign gods, particularly uh, Baal, which was the god of the Canaanites. Asher is the female counterpart to Baal. And so Israel falls into idolatry. When that happens, then God basically says, you don't want to live for me, then fine, if you want to live like these foreign nations, I'll let these foreign nations come in and uh, then you'll cry out for me. And so that's what happens. They, be, they get oppressed by their enemies, then they cry out to the Lord, and then God raises up a judge. A judge is not some, um, you know, legal, um, you know, officer of the court, as we would think of a judge. Uh, these are military uh, leaders that God raises up to give oversight to the nation. Uh, the Hebrew word is shoftim. The, the, the book of Judges in the Hebrew Bible is called shoftim. It means judges after the list of the judges that appear in this book that God raised up. And so then when a judge comes up as God raises up a judge and gives leadership and, and calls the people back to repentance and back to seeking God, that's what they do. And so they are delivered and then they serve the Lord, but only for a time. And then they get back into this cycle. And so in the book of Judges, we see 12 different judges named. Now there are a couple of more outside of the book of Judges. In the book of 1 Samuel you have Eli and you have Samuel who are also judges. But in the book of Judges there are 12 that are mentioned. The ones in capital letters are the ones that were considered more major among the judges. They had uh, more of a major role. They get more press coverage in the book of Judges than do the others. But the one that we're looking at who actually happens to get uh, more coverage than any other judge uh, in, in the Bible is number six on the list, and that is Gideon, or he's number five on the list. He's Gideon. He uh, has chapters six, seven, and eight about him. And, and so uh, along those lines of who he is, his name in Hebrew means hewer, as in one who cuts something down. He is also called Jerubbaal which means uh, let Baal contend. I'll remind us of that in a moment. And that uh, name is given to him after Gideon uh, destroyed his father's altar to Baal. And then also, as I mentioned, Gideon has the most written about him than any other judge. In the, in, when, you, when you look back at chapter 6, and again, I'm just going to summarize things in, in chapter 6. The Midianites are the dominating enemy at this particular time. They join forces with the Amalekites and the Bible says in chapter 6, other eastern peoples and they come against the Israelites. The Midianites have overtaken the land, they have destroyed crops, they have stolen food, they are oppressing the Israelites. And so at this particular time in Israel's history, the Israelites are scared, they have retreated, they are hiding in caves, they are hiding anywhere to get away from the Midianites. And one of these guys who is hiding is Gideon. He's just an unsuspecting guy. He doesn't really, you know, want to be in the public spotlight. He's not like, you know, running to be a judge. He, he's just, as, as we encounter him, he's threshing wheat in a wine press, which obviously would not normally occur. You would, you know, you would crush grapes in a wine press. Why is he threshing wheat in a wine press? Because it, a wine press was hewn out of the ground. So he's, he's down low. He's trying to thresh wheat out of, the, out of the view of the Midianites. So he's, again, trying to, you know, be discreet here. He's, he's afraid of the Midianites. So he's threshing wheat 
we. When the Bible tells us in chapter 6 that an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon, we find out this is no ordinary angel. In fact, a lot of times in the Old Testament when it says the angel of the Lord with the direct article the, it is a reference to an appearance of the Lord. The Lord actually comes and visits Gideon. Now we know this actually happens to be the Lord because if you glance back at chapter 6, when Gideon uh, realizes he's been in the presence of the Lord, it says in verse 22, now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. If you notice there in verse, I'm, I'm in chapter 6, verse 22, when he says, alas, O Lord God, God is in all caps. And when he says, for I have seen the angel of the Lord, the word Lord is in all caps. This is Yahweh Adonai. This is the Lord. This is no ordinary angel. In fact, to substantiate it further, the next thing that Gideon does is he builds an altar in this place to the angel of the Lord, who's really the Lord himself. And he calls it a covenant name. He calls that place a covenant name of God, which is Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. That's there in verse 24. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Shalom or Yahweh Shalom. And so God calls um, Gideon to this task of being a judge. And again, Gideon didn't want to be. He has this dialogue with God there about how he's the least in his family, which is the least among the clans, uh, uh, which is the least among the tribes of Judah. He gives, he gives God every, or rather the tribes of Israel, he gives God every excuse as to why he should not be a judge. But God calls him a mighty man of valor because God often sees us not for how we see ourselves, but for how he sees us and how he wants to use us. Don't ever underestimate what God might want to do in using you. Sometimes we write ourselves off thinking that we could be of no service to the kingdom. But, you know, that's exactly the kind of person God wants, is somebody who really thinks that they're just an ordinary person because God loves to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. Why? Because then he gets the glory. So he sees a guy like Gideon, he says, you're my man. And despite the fact that Gideon didn't think he was, so Gideon wrestles with the Lord about this calling, and he ends up having three questions that he asks of the Lord. And here are his questions. Uh, and I'm not going to go over all the answers because you can go back and listen on the, on the uh, teaching library as to, I covered all these things. But his, his first question was, if God is good, why are bad things happening to us? This is a common question that most people still ask today. Uh, Gideon's situation was that the Midianites were oppressing them. They were hiding. They, the Israelites were afraid. Why, why God, are, are these bad things happening to us? It's a common question that humanity has wrestled with uh, for all of time. So we covered that several weeks ago. His second question is, uh, how could God use me? You know, I seem to be an insignificant nobody. I don't really understand how God could possibly use me. We talked about that. And then the last question that he asked, which is not a direct question, but he intimates this question, and that is, uh, how can I know God's will? And so he goes through this exercise at the end of chapter 6 with a uh, fleece from a, a sheep, and he puts it outside, and, you know, he goes through this exercise with God, you know, one day, Lord, cause the fleece to be wet from the dew, but the ground around it to be dry. And the next day, reverse it. Let, let the fleece be dry and the ground wet from the dew. And he, and he puts God somewhat to a test. Now, God obliges Gideon in this regard to help Gideon and know that this is God's will, that God is calling him to be a judge, that he can go and lead Israel at this particular time. But, you know, don't, don't think you got to go fleece a sheep and put it out in your yard and, and put God to a test. We have something now that we call the Bible and the Holy Spirit. And so through prayer and discernment, you can uh, understand the will of God. But I talked specifically about how to understand God's will last time. So again, I don't want to repeat all that. You can go back and listen to the teaching library. But at this point, what happens is now Gideon has asked his questions. He um, has gotten somewhat of a resolve now. And he understands that God is calling him to this task. And so he sends word to four of the 12 tribes of Israel. We don't know why only those particular four. His own tribe to be one, Manasseh. And he also puts uh, word out to 
Um, let's see if I can find them for you. Um, Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. That's, um, those are the tribes that he calls to help him go fight the Midianites. So he sends a messenger out to these tribes, say, whoever, you know, every male 21 years and older, if you want to fight, come join me at a particular location. And the location is going to be the topic of our study today in chapter 7, which is the spring of Gideon, Gideon Spring, or it is also called in Hebrew, Ein Harod. Uh, here is a picture of it. For those of you who have gone with me to Israel, it's one of our favorite places we stop and have this Bible study. Um, this is a, a somewhat of a cave that is located at the base of Mount Gilboa. And, you know, interesting, uh, Gilboa is where Saul and his sons were killed by the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. Gilboa is from uh, two Hebrew words, gil meaning happiness and boa meaning rushing. When you think about the rushing water that comes out from underneath this, this cave, um, this is a source of happiness because water is a scarce thing uh, in Israel and particularly in this time. And so Gilboa means uh, happiness of, of that which is rushing. So like the, the water coming out, like this is a happy location. And so Gideon puts word out, meet me at the well or the fountain or the spring of Harod. Now, so Ein means well or spring or fountain. Harod me, in Hebrew means terror or fear. And this will be a location where the fearful will be separated from the courageous. So there's interesting, you know, um, reasons why things are named as they are. Uh, this place, you know, called En Harod, uh, because this will be a location where a bunch of fearful people will leave the scene. And so this is our location as we get into chapter 7 now. We're going to find that 32,000 men from those four tribes of Israel meet Gideon here at this spring that is named after him. And so take a look in chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, again, Jeroboam means let Baal contend because back in chapter uh, 6, one of the first things that God told Gideon to do was to destroy the altar that belonged to his father that was built to Baal. And Gideon destroyed that in the middle of the night. The next morning, the townspeople were mad that their, that their altar to Baal, get this, the Israelites were mad that an altar built to a false god had been destroyed. They should have been celebrating. They should have realized this is a time for revival. They, they understood that Gideon was the one behind it. They said to Gideon's father, go bring out your son so we can kill him. Kill him for destroying the altar to Baal. And Gideon's dad had kind of this tactful diplomatic answer. And this is what he says. And you can't really tell if he's trying to stand up for his son or if he's just, you know, trying to, you know, play it safe and be politically correct here. This is what he says. He says, guys, listen, he says to the townspeople who want to kill his son, guys, listen, listen. If Baal really is a god, Baal can contend for himself. So you don't need to go killing Gideon because Baal will just fight for himself. Baal will contend for himself. It's Jerub Baal. So they nicknamed Gideon Jerub Baal. So that's why he's called this in chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerub Baal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod. This is, this is that location, the spring of Herod, the fountain or the well of Herod. So that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. That's about four miles away. So he's ga Gideon is gathering his troops about four miles away from the, the camp of the Midianites. Verse 2, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many, too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. Gilead is another name for Gilboa. 
and 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So that's how we know that he starts with 32,000. 32,000 Israelites, able-bodied fighting men from four tribes of Israel, show up at the spring of a road. They're ready to fight. And God says to Gideon, you got too many men. Now, we're going to find out later that the Midianites number at least 135,000. 135,000. We're going to find that out in chapter 8. We may not get to that tonight. So, with 32,000 fighting 135,000, God says, you got too many. And you got too many because if you were to defeat this larger army, even though that would be a difficult task, 32,000 against 135,000, you might steal the glory from me. So Gideon, you got to send some of these guys home. The first thing that Gideon is allowed by God to do is just to say to the men, if anybody's afraid, go home. And 22,000 go, I'm going home. 22,000. They decide they're going to go home. They go home. So the ones who are left are the real fighting force. You got 10,000. Well, keep reading. But the Lord said to Gideon, this is verse uh, 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. Okay, so so God's saying to Gideon, I'm going to separate out of the 10,000, I'm going to separate the ones who are supposed to go with you and the ones who are not. And this is how he separates them. So, verse 5, so he brought the people down to the water. This is Gideon. He brings the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men, but all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Okay, now... Um, when we go to the Spring of Road on, on our trips to, to Israel, we, we usually demonstrate this. So I, I'm going to demonstrate what, what this probably looked like, although not, you know, just use your imagination because there's no water here. I'm not going to put my face in it. But <laughs> the posture basically is this. You have, you have some of the 10,000 men who would get down like this and they would, they would cup the camera guys. You got to follow me. Sorry, I'm moving out of the camera frame. There we go. So some of the guys would go down like this and scoop the water with their hands, cup it, and bring it up to their mouths and drink. While other guys would get down on their knees and actually face plant into the stream and drink water. Okay, you got the picture here. So the ones who are cupping their hands and drinking water like that they are referred to here as the ones who lap water like a dog. Now, sometimes people get this story reversed. You've got to look very carefully at the language here. The ones who cup water with their hands and bring it up to their mouths are the 300. And those are the ones who are separated, but those are the ones who are compared to lapping the water like dogs. Look again at verse 5. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. So those are the ones being compared to a dog. Now, it it seems almost reversed because somebody who would get down on their face to drink uh, directly out of the stream would be more like what a dog does. But the Hebrew word for lap is yolach. And yolach is the sound that dogs make when they are lapping water. So you hear, if you have a dog, you you know all of that, okay? So the noise of a dog doing all that would be more audible if you're cupping the water, okay, versus if you're planting your face in the water and just sucking it right out of the stream. Okay, a little technicality that probably has no real importance other than this. God separates 300 out of the 10,000. 9,700 guys go home. 
Out of the 10,000, 9,700 guys go home. You're left with 300 who have lapped up the water, cupping it in their hands. There's been a lot of discussion. You can read different Bible commentaries. Why did God choose to distinguish the men in this way? And so there's all these different kinds of theories. Uh, one theory is that the men who kind of crouched and then cupped the water up to their mouths were more alert. They're like, you know, they're not on their face. So those soldiers who are more alert are better fighting men. That's one theory. Uh, another theory is the guys who got down on their knees and drank water directly out of the stream, that's the same posture as the Baal worshipers. And that perhaps it's distinguishing the ones who worshiped Baal from the ones who did not. All kinds of theories. The fact is, we don't know. The truth is, it could have been just very arbitrary that God decided this is the means by which I'm going to separate the 300 guys I want. I mean, I wonder if, in fact, that was God's complete intent was just like, all right, the guys who draw water up to their mouths, those are the ones. And meanwhile, theologians are like, well, I think that means because they're more alert as soldiers, or I think that means that the ones who were dealing are the ones who were Baal worshipers. And all the while, God's probably up in heaven going, oy vey, I just wanted to distinguish the 300. <laughs> Yeah, like there, there's no real like secret hidden meaning here. Sometimes we want to find what's the secret hidden meaning. Maybe it's just God chose to get 300 guys this way. That's it. So we don't fully know. But what we do know is what ends up happening. 300 is the total army that Gideon has to fight with. Again, 135,000 Midianites and Gideon's got 300 guys. How do you think you're feeling if you're the leader right <laughs> about now? You're really nervous. You're like, Wow. I hope this is going to work. But, you know, obviously this is creating a great dependence upon God. And I'll have something to say about that at the end, but let's just continue to look at the text here. And so in verse 7, it says, Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Now, please take note of that. God has made a direct promise to him right there. By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So 9,700 guys go home. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands. Now, the trumpets, don't, don't think of, you know, brass. Uh, the trumpet was the first instrument I learned. I didn't, I didn't really enjoy it very much because I didn't like to read music. Just give me some drumsticks. So I played drums. That's how I, you know, musically. But these are not, bra this is not a brass instrument. This is the shofar. This is a ram's horn. So they each got a shofar. They each got a ram's horn. They took one in their hands. And he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. And it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. Okay, that's the repetition of that promise that God said to him. It's already done. Gideon, I'm giving you the victory in advance. I'm going to give you Midian into your hands. But look, notice this. Notice how gracious God is. Verse 10. But if you're afraid, you know, Gideon, if, if you're wrestling, if you have fears, I love the way that you're going to see here in a moment. God makes allowance for Gideon's normal emotion. You know, sometimes you might think you have to be the super strong person, and, and yes, of course, we need to fight against fear in our lives, and, you know, perfect love drives out fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind, and we know those, those verses, right? We know that fear is not right, but at the same time, God understands our humanity, and He understands our weaknesses. And he understands with Gideon, you're probably afraid right now because I just whittled your army down to 300. And so even though I've told you that I've given you this victory, if you're still afraid, verse 10, if you're still afraid to go down, then go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. And then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now, just pause there. I ask you, 
since he took God up on the offer, what does that mean about Gideon? He's afraid. He's afraid. So he's like, okay, thank you, Lord, for, for this extra test here. So he goes down with Pura, and he goes to the camp of the Midianites, and it says in verse 12, now, the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. as a huge, vast army. And when Gideon had come down, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. And he said, I've had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and it came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Okay, now, picture the scene here. So Gideon is sneaking to the outskirts of the Midianite camp with his servant Purah, and they're listening to a conversation that they just so happen to come upon because God has orchestrated all of this. And it is this Midianite guy. Okay, he's not even an Israelite. He's not even a believer. It's a Midianite guy or an Amalekite, somebody as a part of that army who is saying to a friend a dream that he had, this dream about a barley loaf. Now, barley was a poor man's bread. That was a grain that only poor people ate. And so it is a picture of Israel. The nation of Israel is oppressed by the Midianites. They are impoverished because of the Midianites. This is a picture of Israel, the Israelites, the barley loaf, rolling into the Midianite camp, striking one of the tents. Okay, so he's telling this dream to his buddy there. And his buddy says in verse 14, then his companion answered and said, well, this is, he, he's going to give the interpretation. This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. So these, these two Midianite guys are having this conversation, like, I had this dream of Barty Loaf, I came and hit a tent, I'm not sure what that means. And this other guy is giving the interpretation. He's like, you know what this means? This is the sword of Gideon. Gideon's going to come. This new judge that God has appointed, he's going to destroy us. We're all dead. They're having this conversation, and Gideon and Pura are on the outskirts listening to this. They're eavesdropping. They're hearing this. And guess what happens to Gideon when he hears this? He's like, Oh, they're talking about me, yo. And I'm going to be the victor here. Wow, you know, and it all goes to his head. Now, you're going to see this with me. Take a look. Verse 15, and so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshiped. He began to worship God. He just was so, like, excited, and he began to worship God. The Hebrew there is shaka. He began to worship, and he returned to the camp of Israel, and he said, now he's emboldened. Notice this, arise, he says to his 300 guys, arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Now, stop there for a minute. Why wasn't it enough that God had said that? Why wasn't it enough that God had said, I'm going to deliver Midian into your hands? Why was it that Gideon had to overhear those guys talking to get to the place where now he had courage. Again, it's a reflection of our human nature. Sometimes God makes a promise to you and you just can't seem to accept it or receive it or believe it until you kind of get an encouraging word from somebody else. Okay. Well, if that's what it takes, God knew that's what it would take for Gideon. And God was gracious enough. God didn't get upset. And said, you know, he could have said, what I say is enough. That's all you need to hear. But God's like, you still afraid? Go down to the camp. I'll give you another opportunity to be encouraged. And so now emboldened, Gideon goes back to his camp. He encourages his 300 men. Arise, we're ready to go. Verse 16 says, then he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet into every man's hand, the shofar, the ram's horn, with empty pitchers. These are clay pots and torches inside the pitchers, just so that they could carry them for the moment. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Okay, so he... He's arming them, but notice, not with a weapon. They have no weapons. There's no swords. 
There's nothing here except a trumpet in one hand, a ram's horn in one hand, a torch in another, and they have a, a clay pot or a pitcher. But so that they can carry those three things, they put the torch inside the pitcher. It's unlit for now. And they're just carrying the pitcher with the torch in it, and they've got the ram's horn. And so, keep reading. And so Gideon, this is verse uh, 19. And so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. This is midnight. This is a very stealthy operation at night under the cover of darkness, but this is what's going to help them uh, to be bold, and uh, this is going to play into the appearance of this huge army here. They're coming in the middle of the night. It's midnight. It's the middle of the watch. Just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. So this is like this, you know, it's, it's warfare. Uh, it's kind of the psychological warfare, right? It's, you're going you're gonna to make a sound, and it's going to freak out the Midianites in the middle of the night. They're going to be, they're going to think that they're being attacked by thousands and thousands of soldiers. The sound of the, of the clay pots breaking, the trumpets blowing, it's going to catch them all off guard. It's a psychological warfare, okay, with the hand of God, obviously, upon all of this. And so... Verse 20, then the three companies blew the trumpets, broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands. So now they're, now they're lit. And the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. And when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia toward Zerah as far as the border of Abel Meholah by Tabah. Now, so what's happening is the Midianites start turning on themselves. I mean, it's dark. You know, they don't know what's going on. They can't tell one enemy from another. They start to slaughter each other. God brings this confusion upon them, and he uses this moment, God does, to bring victory. We're going to find out here in a moment that out of 135,000 Midianites, 120,000 end up killing themselves. There's going to be 15,000 left, and Gideon's going to rout them. But this is what's happening. They're turning on each other. They're fighting. It's, the, you know, it's confusion. It's complete panic. It says in verse 23, And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. And then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. By the way, why is that important? You seize the watering places. Because when you control the source of fresh water, you control the day. This is why it's so important even in, in our modern times, why Israel needs to retain control of the, of, um, the Golan Heights. Because, you know, Syria has wanted to take the Golan Heights. Why? Because the Golan Heights is the headwaters of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is the fresh water supply for the nation of Israel. You control the fresh water supply, you control the country. That's why it's important for Israel to retain control of the Golan Heights for their own survival. That's the source of their fresh water supply. And so that's why Gideon says here, go and take all the fresh water sources there, seize them. It says, then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan, verse 25, and they captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Ore and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. There's your trophy for the victory. You might say that these Midianite kings were in over their heads. But anyway, that would probably be inappropriate to say that. They lost their heads on this day. All right. Here's an important thing to take away from this chapter. And it has to do with how God whittled down the army from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300 men. And so as I was taking notes um, and just kind of praying over this chapter this afternoon, here's something I wrote, and maybe this will be meaningful to, to some of you. Sometimes, 
God puts us in the least favorable condition to create the most dependent position on him. And some of you are in one of those least favorable conditions right now. The reason why God wanted to whittle this army down to just a select few was so that Gideon and all of Israel could know that there was no other reason other than the mighty hand of God who did what he did. And sometimes when God allows us to get in these situations where we have no ability in and of ourselves to change it, it is an opportunity for us to see that this can only be done by the mighty hand of God. And God will sometimes allow us to get in these least favorable conditions so that then it will create the most dependent position upon him. So as difficult as it is, as scary as it is, as fearful as it is, and some of you are in the thick of it right now so you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's no other solution for the situation you're in other than God's got to do this. There's no ability that you have to, and use whatever word, to bring victory, to change the situation, to improve it. You have no ability to affect change. This has to be the hand of God so that when that change happens or when the thing improves or when whatever, you will know this is the mighty hand of God. As difficult, as painful, as fearful as it is to be in a place where you feel completely helpless, it is also in another sense, and it's easier said from somebody who's not in the middle of your situation, but just to encourage you as an outsider saying this based on Judges chapter seven, it's also a wonderful place to be because in this sense, it will give you an opportunity to see the mighty hand of God in your life. Don't deny God the opportunity to see his mighty hand at work. Trust him. Trust him. There are reasons sometimes why we get in these predicaments. And sometimes it's our own doing, you know, and God is gracious to get us out of it. And sometimes it's God's doing because he wants you to see his mighty hand. So lean on him, trust him, and see the mighty hand of God at work in your life. That's my encouraging word for you today. Let's pray. Lord, you know exactly some of those people that this is um, most applicable to. You know the situation that they're going through and they feel helpless, they feel fearful, they are worried. And yet sometimes those situations come about because you're wanting to show your mighty hand in their life. And I know, Lord, that when we're in the middle of a situation like that, we pray, well, Lord, show your mighty hand quickly because I don't like being here in this place. This place that is fearful and troubling and worrisome and anxious. But Lord, always in your perfect timing, do you work out your perfect plan for our lives. And I pray you do that for people right now who are just clinging on, trying to trust you through it. Show yourself strong, Lord. Do a mighty work on their behalf. Thank you, Lord, that you're, you're patient with us. You're gracious with us, like you were with Gideon. You knew he was still afraid. You didn't shame him for it. You didn't rebuke him for it. You even encouraged him in another way to help him with his fears. Help people as they are fearful, Lord. Bring along an encouraging word that they might overhear to strengthen them, to help them to wait, to lean on you, to trust you. Thank you, Lord, for this story that Gideon is just as average as the next person, and yet you were so patient with him to help him to know that everything was going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. I pray, Lord, you'd whisper that to people who need to hear it right now by your Holy Spirit, to encourage them, to strengthen them, to give them the courage that they need, Lord, as they trust you, as they wait upon you, 
And Lord, we thank you that you're still at work in powerful ways in our lives today. Glorify yourself, Lord. Glorify yourself in our lives, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. And everybody said, amen and amen.